Hey guys, what's up? This is Chad Hake here in Southern India. I'd like to do a series of videos on Habermas's structural transformation of the public sphere. If you haven't seen my videos on Habermas's theory of communicative action, I'd recommend you to check those out for a more thorough discussion of uh, Habermas and communication. But in this video, we'll talk about first two chapters of the structural transformation of the public sphere, which differs from his theory of communicative action in that here we have a much more historical concern. What happened, for example, especially in the 18th century uh, in the form of the public sphere, which has been in decline basically ever since. There's a lot to discuss, but of course, I'm going to talk first about the elephant in the room, which is Habermas is talking about reason at a time when the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory has told us that reason is to be blamed for all the social problems, not only of recent times, but all the way back in the ancient era, they criticized Ulysses, a mythical figure, for having reason in the form of domination. They claim that reason is domination because it's the desire for the subject to manipulate the world. Even things which seem to be uh, non-politicized rational activities, like mathematical formalization, they assure us actually serve the same end of domination because they, um, because rather than be open to the other as it is in itself, with mathematical formalization, you turn it into so much abstract numerical data to be manipulated at will. They claim that the only way to break out of this this vicious cycle of domination and rationality is to have a mystical experience of mimesis. In mimesis, you make yourself like the other, rather than make the other like you. Habermas noted, however, that this dismissal of reason as inherently evil, and this appeal to some mysterious experience of mimesis, was flawed because it actually equivocated instrumental reason for all forms of rationality. So obviously Habermas acknowledges that what Adorno and Horkheimer talk about there um, is, is something that exists. It's called instrumental reason, where you are manipulating um, things as a means to accomplishing an end. And Habermas admits that that is something which you can do. Um, however, that's not what he means by rationality. Nor even is he interested in the Cartesian rationality in which a single isolated mind thinks logically on an individual level. So Descartes was interested in how anybody with a mind could, in theory, follow the same sort of geometrical proofs to arrive at the same objectively true mathematical um, mathematical truths. That's also not what Habermas is interested in as rationality. Rather, for Habermas, rationality is communicative rationality. When discussion occurs intersubjectively in accordance with rules for proper communication, one can say that people are acting rationally. On the other hand, if you deviate from those rules, you are acting irrationally. For example, one of the rules of communication is you have to be accountable to scientific facts. If you have a complete disregard for scientific facts, um, then you're not behaving rationally. But precisely within the context of communication, are you breaking the rules of rationality? Another rule is respect for cultural norms. If you have no regard for cultural normativity in discussion, you're not behaving rationally. Another rule is respect for the, the rules of language, grammatical well-formedness of your discourse. If you have no regard for grammar, you're not behaving rationally, precisely on communicative levels. The other rules deal with um, expression, and evaluation, and I'd recommend you to check out my videos on communicative action for a more thorough discussion of those. But um, in this video, we'll talk about how um, this emphasis on communication naturally leads to the question of the public sphere. And this is because although sociology studies the public, even professional sociologists in Habermas's era remain somewhat unclear about what public sphere actually is. The only thing that's clear about it, of course, is that if it's public, it's open to all, as opposed to a private sphere, which is ex which would exclude or be closed to certain people. The word itself um, is actually not that old, at least the German word, Offenlichkeit, which Habermas uses, um, only goes back to the 18th century, which was precisely the historical period where public sphere becomes possible as a sociological phenomenon. However, the public-private distinction goes back in a certain sense to ancient Greece, because in ancient Greece, you do have the police, um, and it is koine, which is common. That's why koine Greek is the, the, the type of common Greek spoken around the Mediterranean that the Gospels and the uh, New Testament works were written in outside of, say, 
um, uh, major imperial center. They were kind of out in uh, uh, the Mediterranean areas. Um, so that's Koine Greek. Um, and the police similarly is common as opposed to oikos, which is private, that is the household. However, in this era, the police itself was not really a public sphere because you had to be the master of a household in order to be a participating member of the public. Still, some later values are present at some level, even in the ancient police. For example, this is a place where equals can interact as equals. That's one of the values of communicative rationality. And yet they could still seek to excel within the space. So Aristotle's virtues in the Nicomachean Ethics, which tell you what a good human being, not a moral human being, but a good human being, kind of like a good knife has certain traits. Um, according to Habermas, those are really meant to define the proper ways to excel in the polis, the something like a public space, okay? However, in the Middle Ages, um, you get something like the exact opposite of public sphere. Um, in the Middle Ages, all relations of domination were centered in the Lord's private household. Now, you did have the commons in the Middle Ages. You had marketplaces and fountains um, and uh, grazing grounds, but these, were co these common spaces were not really public as we understand that term. Rather, what was public in the Middle Ages was things like the Lord's, uh, the, the King's Lordship, since the King publicly represented his Lordship for the subjects to see. What he really represented publicly was his inner life power, something he had to have in order to have this level of publicness in the first place. In this case, publicness is not understood as a social realm, but rather as a status attribute which is held by powerful figures. Similarly, badges, clothing, demeanor, even rhetoric in the Middle Ages were considered public along these same lines as a means of staging this sort of representation of power. However, um, this type of public is inherently about excluding the private. A private soldier in the Middle Ages does not publicly represent his own power because he's in the service of the figure who can publicly represent his own power. That's the Lord. Um, Catholic liturgy and Bible were read in Latin, precisely in order to exclude the vernacular language of the private peasant, because the private peasant is one who cannot publicly represent his own power. Later, we get a new form of representative publicness with the early capitalist nobility in northern Italy. The gentleman and courtier replace the old knight. The German word privat begins after the middle of the 16th century, so private is seen in this case as exclusion from the sphere of the state. So the state worker is a public employee to be contrasted with somebody working in a private home or a private business. That's what it means at this time. By the end of the 18th century, the old representative publicness dissolves. The old church powers, the prince, the nobility, they either become private or they become public in a new sense of the word. In some ways, the proto-capitalist shift was removing the very need for this sort of archaic representation. Because a nobleman is what he represents, but the bourgeois is what he produces. So in the, in the 17th century, excuse me, you see a shift. And to discuss this, we need to take a look at how um, we, we, we're eventually moving towards a new public sphere, which has nothing to do with the old medieval view of representation. So the bourgeois public sphere arises along with early finance and trade capitalism. And so in the 14th century, merchant trade required knowledge of distant events. Since this was not yet the era of public newspapers, they disseminated this information through private newsletters. This was a venue which initially, however, still lacked publicness. But by the end of the 17th century, you instead get the public news press. Over time, capitalism also expands from the level of the town to the level of a nation. In turn, the modern state arises precisely through using this um, sort of uh, larger tax base as a source for raising capital. Likewise, we get a new sense of public authority through things like permanent administration, standing army, etc., and civil society as such arises through the depersonalization of state authority. Before the 17th century, the economy largely referred to oikos in the literal sense of a household, and the pater familias was the central figure in the, in the economy. After the 17th century, instead, you 
Uh, understand economy to mean something more like the public market rather than the private household. With this shift, newspapers' dominance grew to the point that daily journals even became common. The news itself somehow became a commodity in the process, since selling to more people literally meant making more profit. This tendency towards massive anonymous sales, in turn, made newspapers something tending towards being uh, public rather than the old private uh, newsletter. So the state uses um, the press also as transposition of publicity of representation into the new form of the public sphere, says Habermas. In this case, the press is used to systematically serve state interests. Likewise, although the press was formally addressed to the public, it was really at this time just for the educated classes. In this case, public could not need all the subjects rather just the bourgeois professionals. By the last third of the 17th century, the press had expanded beyond the mere dissemination of information to instead provide things like instruction, criticism, reviews, etc. And the really big thing for Habermas in the 18th century is coffee houses, okay, because the public sphere shifts from public authority to instead a forum in which private people can compel public authority to have to legitimate itself before public opinion. The subject as a rational subject for Habermas only emerges in the public sphere and the historically unprecedented situation in which people were allowed to make public use of reason. In the 18th century, for example, coffee houses bridged the gap between the collapsing court publicity of archaic times and the emerging bourgeois public sphere. Court was royal representation sphere. Town was public sphere as such, says Habermas. So in England, the court was quite literally something distant because the nobles located themselves in secluded areas. So the town became an autonomous public space with new institutions such as coffee houses. In 1810, for example, London had over 3,000 coffee houses. These were places to discuss first literature and art and then politics and economics. So unlike the court, the coffee house was open even to craftsmen and shopkeepers. The ideal was for intellectuals to be on equal footing. The mind would no longer have to serve the patron who was funding great works of art in earlier times, but could exercise reason publicly. By allowing vernacular discussion, the participants were made into human beings and nothing more than human beings. Rank, for example, was not supposed to matter. Reason was realized in rational communication in the public. Interestingly, the size of various publics vary, but one could still identify a lot of institutional overlap in terms of the communicative procedure involved. First, social status must be disregarded if communication is to be rational. You're not acting rationally if you uh, uh, place social status um, uh, un uh, above the uh, certain equality which individuals would have in communication, in other words. Second, one should discuss previously unproblematized area. This would bring about a shift away from a church or state monopoly on knowledge to instead being able to rationally explore certain uh, areas which had not yet been discussed. Third, a shift from culture to commodity. He argues public is in principle inclusive. So you have the rise of the reading public. So the court aristocracy failed to meet these demands for rationality, since among other things, the court aristocracy was not actually a reading public. There was a shift um, away from earlier art forms like occasional music. This was, this was music which was composed for certain occasions, like worship, court, ceremony, etc. Uh, to instead music with no purpose, this is art for art's sake, which in turn led to a change in public taste. Similarly, painting shifts from the judgment of connoisseurs alone to the general public. You do have art critics, but their only authority lies in having better arguments than other people. The only privilege, in other words, of an art critic, even to art era, is not that there's any special, anything special in their status. It's rather just that they're able to um, argue their uh, viewpoints better than the rest of us, supposedly. This process is therefore inherently believe it or not, democratic, because its basis is the public use of reason in communication. Interestingly, the spectator from um, Addison, and still if you've read that, this sort of anonymous guy's testimony um, uh, 
within London becomes a mirror to this process because it is now the public discussing itself. So the anonymous guy in The Spectator is actually just the public discussing itself. So the 18th century is the century of letters. The 18th century bestseller, Pamela, um, is actually just a novel of letters. Paradoxically, letters are experiments with subjectivity, precisely because a letter always presupposes there's an audience who reads it. In turn, individuals would meet in public in order to discuss what they had read. One might argue that subject subjectivity communicated with itself to gain clarity about itself. Similarly, the law came to be rationalized against the inherent tendency for the prince to have secrecy. Critical public deba debate uh, develops to pursue an overlap between what is right and what is just. At the level of political theory, law eventually comes to be related to public opinion as the expression of reason. So, interestingly, abstract rational law requires public opinion, while princely sovereignty merely requires legislative competence. The universal rules of communicative rationality would take precedence over rank, social status, things like that. Here we get a notion of liberty and equality, but it comes from a communicative foundation. In the next video, we'll focus on chapter three of the shift from the literary public sphere to the political public sphere. Thank you for watching.